in the beginning, I thought only Bert was talking tonight. But as it went on, the program got bigger. But the first thing that Bert said was, I really want Bernardine to be, be there. He felt an emotional connection that Bernardine was always there to support him. She come to the MSU campus when Bert was going through his struggle, his battle with the MSU administration uh, fighting for his tenure track that he didn't get and should have gotten. Um, but anyway, uh, I eventually realized that I just didn't know who Bernardine was at the time, but I remembered that woman who came to campus. Um, but I didn't even realize that when I met her in New York in 1981 and she was warm and gracious and this, oh yeah, later I, that's, I met her before. Anyway, here's Bernadine Dorn. Yeah. Um, it's great to see this group of people here, I have to say. I just want to say uh, one word about Bird and let him speak for himself. But, you know, uh, you can count pretty much, don't even need your toes, to count the number of people who were academics and teachers who risked everything in that tenure period to side against the war, to side for justice, and to join, throw their lot in with the students. I can only think of three or four people, well, maybe five or six, um, who did what Bert did. And really, uh, on one hand, at great cost, thrown off track, uh, uh, really creating a different life, a much more ad hoc life than tenure would get you. Uh, and really, in a way, becoming a teacher in a new guise, right? A teacher uh, without university or with many universities. Um, and I, I think uh, it's important to recognize that, that uh, what it took to do that at that time. These weren't accidental choices. They were the very deliberate and conscious choices. And Bert laid down a path that was, uh, you know, a model and admirable. And uh, and he stayed the course. Another kind of extraordinary thing. I, I think actually it's not extraordinary. And my experience just traveling in the last 10 years has been that you know the majority of people who are activists um, have stayed the course in a way. Uh, in a variety of ways, uh, devoted uh, to overthrowing everything hateful about this government and corporate structure that we live in, capitalism itself, herself, him, himself, and um, and uh, and determined to try to keep open and figure out how to move on. So I I really agree with the spirit um, that Al laid down and that and that Bill and uh, Bob have built on here. We have so much more in common than our differences, and it's important to still talk about our differences. Forty years ago this year, April, 40 years ago, um, Dr. King, who threw me into political action when he came to Chicago in 1965, um, said really, and was always uh, not the Dr. King we celebrate these days, but really um, a dynamic person in progress always in progress, always learning and changing and growing. And in fact, was probably assassinated or murdered in the way he was because of where he was going around economic rights and uh, around uniting the issues of empire and uh, economic power for the toiling people here. Um, he said, the greatest purveyor of violence on this earth is my own country. That's an incredible thing to have said. It's an incredible thing to have said. He said it at the height of the Cold War. He said it at the height of the Vietnam War. But he said it at a time where all of the forces around him didn't want him to say it, didn't want him to think it. It wasn't like he had a lot of support in making that move. Uh, he really, again, was breaking with the churches. He had get most of the churches. He, again, was breaking with academia, almost all of academia. He again was breaking with uh, the civil rights movement in the sense of the chosen leadership, not the ground of the civil rights movement, but the anointed leadership of the civil rights movement. His funders, the union movement, who, the, you know, the uh, parts of the union movement that supported him. Uh, and, and it was an incredible 
thing for him to say, the greatest purveyor of violence on this earth is my own country. There were certainly other purveyors of violence. I think that that's still true today. If we think it's true today, that has incredible implications for all of us right now. We who are, as we used to say, in the belly of the beast. Right? It again means not that it's the only purveyor of violence in the world, but that we have an extraordinary special responsibility, not necessarily the most enviable one, of how to act here inside the heart of the monster. And I think uh, that we had a couple of things, a bead on a couple, at least we, me, had a bead on a couple of things back then. And then a lot of other things we were wrong about or didn't understand at all or didn't even see on the horizon. But the couple of things still animate me. And one is the question of empire and imperialism, the merger of capitalism and empire, and how that plays out on the globe, and why all of us get to lead the lives we live, even if we try to live simply, and even if we try to constantly risk what we have. Uh, it, you know, where does our wealth come from? And where does our good teeth come from? And, uh, you know, our longevity and what we are able to do for our children. <laughs> The second thing we had a bead on, and I think has only, in my mind, strengthened over time, is the whole structural implications of white supremacy and the ways in which race and class and gender are just so intertwined in the United States that it's almost impossible to say it, in a sing still to me, to say it right in a single sentence. Because there's so many ways to mystify, to mystify it, you know, and to say we're beyond race now, or, or you know, we're colorblind, or all the variations that this, you know, that go on around how we talk about it. And I think um, I just want to note that one of the the beautiful things that you said in in talking about the realities and the nitty gritty of Kent State and about state power is that there has always been at Kent State still a kind of a fabulous effort to unite the Kent State experience with the Jackson State experience, which happened within the same 10-day period, you know. And so you have an all-black school in the South where students are shot down at the same time as you have the Kent State experience here in the, in the heartland. And I, th I think uh, that relationship is always something that we have to strive for. <clears throat> 